if you're like me, you hate not knowing what comes, what's coming next. You hate not knowing the end. You want to know that the good guy wins, the bad guy loses, and that everything is going to turn out okay. You want to know the resolution. You want to know the end of the story. And so one of the most annoying things to me is when a movie or a TV show ends with to be continued because it means that everything's not okay yet. Everything hasn't been resolved. We don't know if the good guy is going to get out alive or if everything's going to turn out all right. And sometimes that's how our lives can feel. And we don't like that. We want to we know the end. We want to know what's coming next so we can feel like we're in control. And so we want to know when the mortgage is going to be paid off, when the project is going to be done, when the weather is going to change or the seasons are going to change. Apparently it's Monday in about three hours. Wichita weather is crazy. We want to know when the end times are coming. We want to know when our time will be up. And this is nothing new. People have been asking this question forever. And, and we might be a generation of people who are more conscious of time in the day-to-day because -day we have watches and clocks to tell us the hours and the minutes. But people have always been asking, what happens after I die? What, what is the end going to be like? And you, know, you have some people that say there's nothing after the end. We just dissolve and decay and return back to the earth. Or you have the Hindu view of reincarnation that we'll just come back as someone or something else. Or you have the, the idea that we'll be judged based on our actions on the last day. Hopefully your good outweighs your bad, but who knows right now. Or you have the universalist mode, which is that everyone's going to be saved regardless of what they do. It doesn't matter what you do. God is love, and, and who cares what you believe or what you do, because God's just going to save everybody. But what does God's word say? And, and today we heard the words from the prophet Zephaniah that, on the last day, he's going to come and there's going to be anguish and darkness and turmoil and tumult. And it's going to be a scary, scary day. And so and he says that we need to be prepared and we need to be ready because that day is coming. And it's coming sooner than you think. And on that day, God is going to punish the wicked and the unjust, those who do evil. And so as I, as I was meditating on this text and thinking about it, the words of, of the poet Edgar Allan Poe came to mind. Deep into that darkness, long I stood there, peering, fearing, doubting. You know, I just, I had to wonder, where do I stand? Because that's an honest question that, that I think we all need to ask. Where are we standing when that day comes? And, and I want to make something abundantly clear to you. The day of the Lord for us is the day we die. And that day could be coming tomorrow, or in 10 years, or in 80 years. We don't know. But there is no second chance after death. You don't get a second go around, and you don't get to, to change your decision. You don't get to change where you stand after that day. And, and so even if Jesus comes in 2,000 years, when you die, your, your soul and your, your body and your spirit are torn apart. And so it feels like an instant between the time you die and when you're standing before the throne of Jesus. And so I had to ask myself, where am I standing? Because, you know, I try and be a good person, but I, I fall short, oh so short, of the glory of God. I mean, I can utter the words of come thou fount with anybody else. I am prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. My sinful nature is constantly turning against God, constantly rebelling against what he would have me do. And, and I'm not the only one, you know. On that last day, it, it's a scary thing because we, it says that everything that's in the darkness, is going to be brought to light. Everything you've ever done is going to be exposed. And even those outside the church, those that are non-Christians, hear that and, and they recognize that that's a scary thought of having everything you've ever done being brought to light. It's part of their conscience. They understand that, that what you've done, we often fail to do what we should. We either don't do the right thing or we fail to do the right thing when we have the opportunity. And, and they might not call these shortcomings sin. But they realize when, when everything push comes to shove and everything's exposed, none of us can really claim to be good people. So as we move to the New Testament and hear Paul's words to the Thessalonians, and he says that he is looking forward, longing for that day. 
You have to ask the question, how can you be longing for that day when, when this destruction, this darkness, this judgment is coming? And his answer is that for those of us who are in Christ Jesus, we are destined for, not for wrath, but for salvation. We're going to be brought home and we're going to be brought into the family of God. We're brought in there by what Jesus has done. But another question comes to mind as I, as I hear those words. Well, the God of the Old Testament, the God that, that I know is, is righteous and just and holy. And ignoring the sin and evil of all those who are in Christ doesn't sound like justice to me. It doesn't sound like a righteous judge to me if you just ignore everything that anybody else has done. So what happened to the God of the Old Testament, the God who, who, condemned, who destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah for their sins, who gave the promised land to Israel because of the sinfulness of the pagan nations? Where is the God who, who caused the flood to drown most of the people of Noah's day because he saw the wickedness of mankind's heart? Where is, where is the God described in Psalm 29 whose voice shatters the cedars, blows them to smithereens, the God who stands enthroned over the flood, the God whose voice causes the, the wilderness to tremble, the mountains to skip? Where is that God? Has that God just disappeared now that Jesus has come? Is God today just a God of, of puppy dogs and sugar and spice and everything nice? Just a God of love who ignores all that's happened, all that's been done in the world? No. He doesn't ignore the, the murderers, the slanderers, the, the backstabbers, those who take advantage of widows and orphans. That God has not disappeared. But for those of us in Christ Jesus, while the day we're before the, the throne of God is still to come, that judgment has already been carried out. It was carried out almost 2,000 years ago on a hill outside of Jerusalem on a dark Friday afternoon as the Son of God hung on the cross and bowed his head and, and said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And as he pleaded before the Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The wrath of God that we deserve was poured out on him while he went on to the way of the cross. The wrath, the judgment that we deserved was carried out as the blood poured down his head and came out of it, the wounds in his hands and his feet. He took it all upon himself willingly. It was there that the justice, the righteousness, the holiness of God met his love, his mercy, and his compassion. They came together so that God could be both just and merciful, both righteous and loving and faithful to his promise to redeem us. You see, it was there at the cross that the great reversal happened, that, that God took the, the punishment that we deserved and gave us his righteousness. It says that God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that through him we might become the righteousness of God. You see, there is where is what we experience grace. And, and grace, grace is what makes life not fair. It means that God took on the punishment we deserved and gave us his righteousness in return. God took our place and made us holy. And so that means that we don't have to struggle to try and justify ourselves before God. We don't have to prove ourselves to him. We could never prove ourselves to him. His love is unconditional. His love is a guarantee. And that means our struggle now is against the, the spiritual forces, the, the forces of sin in our life, the, the powers of darkness. We struggle against those things to get our will more and more in line with God's will and our actions more and more in line with the kind of God who has come and has saved us. And so we can hear the Apostle Paul's words to not worry about the dates or the times because we know the end of the story. We know how it all turns out. We know that even though we're in the middle of the to be continued, we know what the resolution is. And if you want to want to get a better picture of, of what it's going to be like, read Revelation 21 again and, and hear about the new heavens and the new earth and a place where there is no more sin. There, is no more, there are no more tears, no more death, no more war. And God is living in the midst of his people. You see, this, this day of, of God's coming is going to be a shock. It's going to be like a thief in the night when people don't expect it. But for those of us in Christ Jesus, it's like when a child returns home unexpectedly. Initially, the parent might be shocked, but there's overwhelming joy at that reunion. So when that day comes, we'll be shocked at the end of the times, 
but we'll be overjoyed because we will be in our God's kingdom with our God. And he will be present right there with us. And that's such a wonderful, wonderful thing. And, and so as we, as we think about what that means, and, and as you realize that, and I realize you're, we're in the midst of this story. We're in the middle of God's story. We're in the middle, and, and in our day-to-day lives, it can seem like a to-be-continued. Well, we don't know how it's going to turn out. And you might be in the middle of, of difficult times, of struggles, of sufferings, of, of pain. I don't, I don't know what's going on in all of your lives, but no matter what is happening, you know the end of the story. You know the last line. God has the answer. God has the final say, and that gives us hope. It gives us hope for what is to come because we know that, that our lives, our salvation is secure in his hands. And so that gives us courage. It gives us strength. It gives us boldness and a certain urgency to go out into the world and proclaim God's victory over sin, death, and the devil. And we, we can proclaim that God has won over sin, that he loves sinners, that he has mercy, compassion, and forgiveness for the lost, the broken, and the hurting. We can proclaim the good news that God is in control. God is over all things, that his reign is sure, and it is already happening now, even though it hasn't come in its fullness. We can proclaim that gospel, that if you just believe in his son, you will have salvation. And so we don't have to fear that coming day of the Lord as Zephaniah describes it, but rather like Paul and like the words of, of come thou fount of every blessing, we can trust that God by his good grace is going to bring us home. And so we're no longer wandering from the fold of God, but we are secure in his love and our, our gaze is fixed upon the mount of his redeeming love because we recognize what he has done. And when we see all that, even though we're in the middle of a to be continued, we have, we have peace with our past rather than guilt. We have love for the present rather than shame. We have hope rather than fear for the future because we know that God is in control, that his reign is secure. We know that on the last day, as the psalmist declares, that all will cry glory and all will recognize God as king. All will bow, every knee will bow and confess him as Lord. And so we can have strength for whatever comes in the day to day. We can go out with boldness and courage. And we can go out secure in his love, his forgiveness, as members of his kingdom already here and now. And so may that peace, may that hope, may that love, which surpasses all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please rise as we confess in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God.